Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, this Friday. Um, yeah, it's, it's my huge pleasure to uh, introduce Mary Wouters from Stanford. So as, as many of you know, she just gave a talk in LID seminar. And, uh, and uh, now you sort of can realize how, bread, how broad uh, her uh, work is, because on, on Monday she was talking about the, um, uh, sort of uh, reliable circuits, right? Computation with noise. And today she will talk about uh, something that is very dear to uh, my heart. And uh, I hope to many of you is the topic closely related to error correcting codes. Now, Mary um, obtained her PhD in mathematics in 2014, and uh, she became sort of very uh, famous and very well known for her groundbreaking work on locally repairable uh, codes. Uh, that's, uh, so, so her work tends to be very algebraic, and, um, and, uh, and lately she started combining this algebraic ideas with the stochastic ideas, and I think that's very fitting that we would uh, have her uh, in the stochastic seminar. And uh, um, so Mary received multiple awards. Uh, I don't think uh, we should uh, mention the long list. I, I will only mention one thing that she's a Sloan Research Fellow, uh, which is a very high distinction. And uh, I think I'm not gonna waste any more of your time and let's uh, instead enjoy the, uh, uh, Mary and Mary Wouters. Thank you, Mary, you can start. All right, thanks Yuri for, for the very generous introduction. Um, uh, let me share my slides. Uh, okay, can can y'all see this? Great. Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks everyone for coming today. Um, yeah, so I, I'm really excited to talk to you today about uh, sharp thresholds for random subspaces um, with, uh, as you already mentioned, some applications in list decoding. Um, and uh, this is based on joint work uh, with Jonathan Mosheyev, Nick Resch, Nogaranzui, and Shashwat Silas. Um, and you can find a, a relevant paper here, um, and it will be in uh, show up in the conference Fox soon. Okay, so what is this talk about? Um, so at a high level, this talk is about combinatorial properties that are satisfied by random subspaces over finite fields. Um, so that is like I've got uh, some random subspace V. I'm going to draw it like this. So it's it's over a finite field. So it's some finite set, and I'm interested in properties like. Uh, is it the case that not too many points in V are too close together? You know, that maybe not, not too many points in V live in any Hamming wall or something like that. Um, so for, for properties like this, uh, you know, very low dimensional subspaces are very likely to satisfy these properties because they have not too many points. They're all kind of spread out. They're not going to be too close together. Whereas very high dimensional subspaces are really likely not to satisfy these properties because there's tons of points. They're all squished together um, and they're very likely to, to live in some Hamming ball. Um, and uh, I'm basically, for this talk, I'm gonna be interested in like, what is the, the dimension K of this subspace where there's sort of a threshold between really likely to satisfy the property and really likely to not satisfy the property and how sharp is that threshold? Um, so that's sort of the, the probability question that I'm gonna be interested in. Um, as, as the title of the talk uh, mentioned that there are some underlying applications to error correcting codes, which I'll kind of wave my hands at very briefly, um, but for, for this talk and you know, stochastics and statistics seminar, uh, I wanna focus on the sort of this, this probability question. Um, in particular, if it, I think I said the paper along with the title of an abstract earlier. And if, if you looked at the title of the paper, you'd be like, what the heck does this have to do with um, th this seminar? But I, I promise it's, it's really just a probability question. Um, cool. OK, so the, the plan for the talk is that first, I'm going to give a quick introduction to these. So what sorts of combinatorial properties am I interested in? And a little bit of hand waving about error correcting codes. Um, then I'm going to talk about a uh, threshold theorem. Um, so the answer to that question, like, is there a sharp threshold is yes. For a very broad class of properties, there is a sharp threshold. There is some dimension of random subspace so that a little bit below that dimension, these properties are really, really likely to be satisfied. And a little bit above, they're really, really likely to not be satisfied. Um, and moreover, I'm going to be able to give a, a pretty clean characterization of this threshold. Um, and then uh, at the end, if I have time, I'm going to uh, tell you about the, sort of the reason we were motivated to, to look at these questions, which is an application to low density parity check codes. Um, but in, in terms of this uh, probability question about combinatorial properties of random subspaces, uh, basically what, the, what this result is, is saying is that uh, there are lots of properties that we care about certain subspaces holding. And lots of people have thought really hard about when a uniformly random subspace satisfies these properties. 
for uh, these things called LDPC codes, these are a less random subspace. So this is a, a much more structured random subspace. And basically we're gonna say that for free, any suitably nice property that holds for uniformly random subspaces is also going to hold for this more structured random subspace. And it's basically gonna fall out of this characterization of, of the threshold here. Um, so that's, that's sort of where, where we're going. All right, so let me get started with a uh, sort of quick introduction to what, what are random subspaces and what are the nice properties that I care about um, them satisfying, um, and a little bit of hand-waving about coding theory. Okay, so random subspaces over finite fields. Um, so just for the set notation and, and some jargon. Um, so for all of this talk, Blackboard F is going to be a finite field. Um, if it's been a while since finite fields, don't worry about it. You can just think of F as being F2, which is just 0, 1 with arithmetic mod 2. That'll set you, that, that'll be fine for almost all of the talk. Um, so just think F equals F2 if you want. And what do I mean by a subspace over a finite field? Same thing as a subspace over the reals. A, a subspace, a, a subset V of F to the N is a subspace if it's closed under addition and scalar multiplication. So for example, here is a subspace of F2 to the 6 of dimension 2. I take you know, any two linearly independent vectors. So these are vectors of length six with zeros and ones in them. And I look at their span, that's gonna give me four vectors, zero, the first basis vector, the second basis vector, their sum. Uh, and, and then this here is, is a subspace of dimension two, it has size four. The reason I'm being a little bit pedantic about what I mean by a random subspace uh, over a finite field is that for, as I did on the previous slide and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to draw them like this. Um, here, I guess the, the dots are meant to indicate that it's like this discrete finite thing and the little cartoon of the plane in R3 is meant to indicate that there's some linear structure going on. Um, but this is a completely misleading picture. This, this is not what these, how you should think of these things. Um, they, they don't look like they live in R3. Think about them like this, like, like they live you know, as a subset of the hypercube. Um, so I'm going to use this cartoon, but um, don't, don't think about this as the geometry. Okay. Um, all right, so that's subspaces over finite fields. I'm interested in a random subspaces over finite fields. Um, a random subspace over finite field is a random subspace, uh, right? So there's a finite number of them, take a uniformly random one, that's what I'm gonna call a random subspace. Um, equivalently, take a random basis and look at its span. Cool. Okay, so uh, those are the, the objects I'm interested in. Um, how about the questions? So here, here's one question you can ask about a random subspace over a finite field. Uh, so, Here's my subspace V. It's got a bunch of points. I can ask how close together are any two points in V? So like what is the closest any two points in V can be to each other in Hamming distance? And here Hamming distance is defined up here. It's just the number of coordinates on which any two, on which two vectors differ. So um, yeah, so here I'm saying like I got this finite collection of points, like look at every single pair of points. What is the closest that, that any two of them can get? Um, so that's some random variable over the randomness of, of my subspace. I want to know what's its expectation, how's it concentrated, and stuff like that. Um, okay, that's one question you can ask. Here's another question. Um, suppose you have a uh, uh, same random subspace, but now I want to know, like, what is the maximum number of points V that lie in any Hamming ball of radius Pn? So I think of like drawing my random subspace, and then I'm going to take my, my Hamming ball, and then I'm just sort of going to move it all around the space. And I'm going to try to capture as many points as possible. And the question I'm interested in is when, when I do this, when I move it all around, what's the most number of points I can capture? Right. Um, once again, that's a random variable. What's its expectation? How is it concentrated? And so on. All right. Um, this is a fun game. I can ask these questions for you know any sort of uh, you know object that I want. Like how about for same question for a combinatorial rectangle? Right. I've got um, some uh, combinatorial rectangle S1 cross S2 cross dot 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 cross S n where each SI is the subset of my field. Um, here's the one point where you should not think of F as being F2, but rather some larger finite field. But take any subset of, of size not too large or any bunch of subsets of size not too large and, and look at their, their direct uh, product and right, how, how many points are contained in any such thing. Um, once again, that's a random variable. What's its expectation? How is it concentrated? Um, and at what dimension do I expect this to be really large? And at what dimension do I expect this to be really small? Okay, so those are the sorts of questions I'm interested in. Let me say a little bit about why I'm interested in these questions. Um, so the motivation for these comes from error correcting codes. Um, so uh, this first question that I asked um, about pairwise distances, uh, this is a very classical question, um, also has a classical answer, which I'll mention in a moment, which is what, what is the distance of a random linear code? Uh, so let, let me unpack that jargon for a little bit. Um, so a code is uh, basically just a subset of points in f to the n. 
And one, one reason we care about codes, especially codes where every pair of points is far apart, is that they can be used for communication, um, for reliable communication in the presence of noise. Uh, so basically the, the connection is as follows. Suppose I have a set of points, like this set of points, where every pair is, is reasonably far apart. Then I'm going to associate with each point um, in my set uh, a message. And uh, you know, if I'm a sender, I'm going to, if I want to send that message, I'm going to send the, send the corresponding point. It goes through some noisy channel and it gets corrupted a little bit. So maybe what the receiver sees is something like this, a little bit far away from the message. But if all of the points are pairwise far apart, then I, then I can round back to the, to the message that I originally meant to send. Um, so in that way, I can sort of correct errors. Um, and we say that a code that is just a subset of points has good distance if uh, all of the points are pairwise far apart. Um, so that's what, what the distance of a code is. Uh, I'm interested in these random subspaces that correspond to so-called random linear codes. So a code is linear if it, if it is a subspace, um, and a random linear code is a random linear code. Um, the, the reason that people, so random linear codes are, are very well studied in coding theory. There's a bunch of reasons one might care. One of them is just sort of existential results. If you want to know that there exists a linear code that does thus and such, uh, studying a random linear code is a good place to start. Um, and for a lot of different properties, uh, we basically only have these existential results. And so if you want like efficient constructions and stuff like that, um, a, a common way to start is to um, use these existential results to get like some little building block and then um, you know, bootstrap off of that to get some larger uh, explicit construction. Um, so for, for, for these reasons, random linear codes are, are reasonably well studied uh, within coding theory. And the question of their distance is um, again, sort of a, a classical question. Um, that spoiler alert, we already know the answer to, I'll, I'll tell you in just a minute. Um, okay, so that's this first question. Uh, the next question I asked was, uh, what is the list decodability of a random linear code? Uh, right, so I'm defining list decodability here. This, this question is the same as uh, how many points live in a Hamming ball. Um, so I'm not gonna formally define list decodability, but basically we, we say that a code is list decodable if not too many points live in a Hamming ball. It's exactly this question. And the reason that we care is um, intuitively this Hamming ball sort of represents a region of uncertainty for the decoder in the, in, uh, in, in the communication setting that I waved my hands at just a minute ago. And if there are not too many points contained in this region of uncertainty, then there's not, you know, not too much confusion. Um, similarly, this question about the combinatorial rectangle also has a name, it's called list recoverability. And it uh, once again refers to a different sort of error model where um, the region of confus confusability happens to look like a, uh, like a combinatorial rectangle. Um, okay, so uh, th those are basically the you know, super high level, the reasons why I at least was first uh, motivated to think about these questions. Um, I'm not gonna go into any more details about these motivations in the talk, um, but you know, please ask me later if you're interested, I'd love to talk about those. Okay, so given that these questions, like I said, are reasonably well studied, what, what is known for these questions? All right, so I'm gonna give uh, sort of a quick cartoon of what's known for, for each of these three questions and um, there'll be something in common uh, between, between these three. So the first question, how far apart are any two points, AKA what is the distance of a random linear code? So like I said, this is a, a pretty classical question and there, there's a classical answer in, in the form of the gilbert Barshamov bound. Um, so what this says is the following. So here I have a, a graph and on the x-axis is um, the so-called rate of the code. So uh, here, just some jargon. When I say rate, I'm gonna to try to avoid using coding theory jargon, but it might just fall out. Um, but when I say rate, I mean um, the dimension of the subspace divided by uh, the dimension of the ambient space. So if I have a k-dimensional subspace and f to the n, the rate is just k divided by n. So it's just like a normalized dimension. Um, so over here on this side of the x-axis, I have very high dimensional subspaces. And down here, I have very low dimensional subspaces. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting the probability that a random k-dimensional subspace has distance at least delta. Um, that is the probability that all pairs of points are at least delta n apart. That was this first question that I asked. And if, if you uh, actually plot this, it turns out that the answer looks something like the following. There's some threshold rate, r star, it happens to be one minus the binary entropy of delta, it doesn't really matter for this talk, but there's, there's some threshold rate, so that if you back off from that threshold rate by a little bit, so you look at just slightly lower dimensional subspaces, then it's really, really likely that this property is satisfied. That is, it's really, really likely that no two points are too close together. On the other hand, if you go a little bit above that threshold, you look at slightly higher dimensional subspaces, 
then all of a sudden it becomes really, really likely that this property is not satisfied. It's very, very likely that you can find two pairs of points that are, that are close together. Right. Um, and this, uh, this threshold is, is quite sharp. Um, right. Okay, so that's what's known for, for this question. Um, let me tell you about the next question. Uh, turns out the picture looks pretty similar. Right. So the next question is how many points lie in any Hamming ball? So I, I take my subspace, I take a Hamming ball, I move it all around, I try to capture the most number of points as possible, and I ask the, the property that I'm interested in is not too many points lie in a Hamming ball. And the picture looks pretty similar, um, although it's, uh, this turns out to be a much harder question. Um, so essentially there is some threshold rate, it's about, uh, or some threshold, <clears throat> if not a threshold rate, at least a, a small threshold region, which is about one minus the entropy of P, where the Hamming ball that I'm interested in has um, distance Pn. So that if I back, or sorry, has radius Pn. So that if I back off from that uh, threshold rate, so back off, look at slightly lower dimensional subspaces, um, then it becomes really, really likely that not too many points lie in any Hamming ball of that radius. But if I look at slightly higher dimensional subspaces, then it becomes really, really likely that you can find uh, a bunch of like lots, 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 and lots of points that, that live in a Hamming ball of that radius. Um, yeah, so that, that's uh, that's sort of what what's known for this picture. We can ask the same question uh, again for um, this combinatorial rectangle setting, like how many points lie in any cube? And once again, the picture looks really similar. There is some threshold rate, slightly lower dimensional subspaces are really likely to not have too many points in any combinatorial rectangle. Um, but slightly higher dimensional subspaces are really likely to have a bunch of points that live in some combinatorial rectangle. Um, so uh, I guess before I go on, does, does this make sense? Any questions at this point? So yeah. Mary, there is one question for, oh yeah, Bryce, you can ask yourself. Oh. Yeah. Um, so in, in the regime where there's um, a high probability of lots of points in the Hamming ball. Um, how many points is lots of points? Is it uh, like, it's more than O of one, but is it like polynomial on P? That's a good question. Yeah, so um, the exact answer for how many points is lots of points, uh, or like the exact form of this big O of one is still a little bit open. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically the list decoding capacity theorem. So actually this is even, this picture is a little bit misleading because it looks like there's some non-zero probability here. What the list decoding capacity theorem says is that actually, if you go a little bit above this threshold, um, so if you look at R star plus epsilon, um, then actually there is no, no set, random linear code or otherwise, um, that uh, can avoid having too many points in a Hamming ball. Uh, in particular, to answer your question, if you go just a little bit above this, any set is going to have exponentially, number, exponentially many points in N in a Hamming ball. So as, as soon as you get a little bit above this threshold, like necessarily the number of points in a Hamming ball blows up exponentially. Cool. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, and then of course a little bit less than that, we can hope that there's, there's some constant number that doesn't depend on N. Um, and then there's some maybe tiny region where it might be polynomial or something, which is not, not super understood. Um, more, more questions? Awesome. Okay, um, yeah, so just to sort of summarize the, the story so far here. Um, so I told you three questions about uh, random linear subspaces over finite fields. Um, I waved my hands about why uh, they were motivated by coding theory. And I told you that they all have sharp thresholds. They all have pictures that look like this. Um, and so what, what I'm gonna tell you for the rest of the talk is that this threshold behavior is a very general phenomenon. It doesn't just hold for these three properties that I told you about. It actually holds for any local property uh, where intuitively a local property is a property that is defined by the exclusion of forbidden sets. So for example, the Hamming ball thing, excuse me, is defined by the exclusion of um, bunches of points that are all too close together. Right. So yeah, so I'll say that for, for any such property, any, any property that's defined by the exclusion of reasonably small bad sets, um, satisfies uh, sort of threshold behavior like this. Um, and I'll also give you a reasonably clean, I, I think, characterization of this threshold. Um, so not, not just that it has a threshold, but I can tell you sort of what R star looks like in terms of the property. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, if time, I'm going to talk about an application about sort of carrying uh, properties over from uniformly random space, ra uniformly random subspaces to not quite uniformly random subspaces. Um, in particular, uh, 
like these results up here, these are sort of like with high probability results. So they say if, if you have a subspace of dimension not too big, then with high probability, your property is satisfied. Um, and a lot of work has gone into establishing these for random linear subspaces um, because of that connection to random linear codes that I mentioned earlier. And what we're gonna be able to do is basically transfer these, these positive results um, down to uh, a more structured ensemble of random subspaces. And we'll say that basically any, any property that holds with high probability for a completely random subspace um, is also going to hold with high probability for a certain ensemble of structured random subspaces, which um, are motivated by coding theory, um, so-called LDPC codes. But uh, sorry, Mary, is, is that just not true, for instance, for minimum distance of uh, linear random linear codes versus uh, LDPCs? Um, right, so what, which LDPC codes am I talking about? Um, so I'm, I'm looking in particular at uh, Gallagher's ensemble of LDPC codes. Um, so Gallagher's ensemble actually does uh, meet the gilbert Marshall bound, just, just like, uh, uh, just like ran random linear codes. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay, so you're, you're saying, uh, uh, okay, yeah, all right. So is, is okay, I mean, uh, are we saying that LDPCs, uh, so the way I, I rem I remember them, you just pick, uh, yeah, they're defined by the parity check matrix, right? And then every column is a sparse. So you're saying those have the same minimum distance as linear codes? Correct, yeah. So if you look at a, um, so we're, we're looking at a, not, um, not any way of choosing that parity check matrix, but if you choose it randomly according to sort of a natural uh, distribution, um, this is called Gallagher's ensemble of LDBZ codes. This is the distribution that Gallagher came up with in the 60s. Um, so like take a random sparse matrix and look at its kernel, mm -hmm. that subspace, uh, yeah, it actually does meet the gilbert varshavov bound and, and Gallagher showed this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sorry that I'm being a little hand wavy about this. When, when we get to part three, I'll, I'll be slightly more precise, um, although not much, <laughs> um, but yeah, please do keep asking questions. Um, but yeah, so, the, and also, uh, yeah, so a couple of caveats with this. One, it's, uh, our results are only gonna hold for this particular, uh, you know, as I'm instantiating them here, are, are only for this particular um, structured ensemble of LDPC codes. And also it's not, it's not any property, it's any uh, sort of suitably nice property, which is what's called local, which I'll define in just a moment. Um, any other questions now? Please do keep asking questions and interrupting me because otherwise I'm just like all alone in my office talking to myself and that's very sad. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate questions. Okay, um, so this is the plan. Uh, let's let's get into it. Um, so the first thing uh, is sharp thresholds for local properties. I need to tell you what a local property is. Um, so here's a definition of a local property. Um, so suppose that curly B is a collection of sets B1, B2, and so on, subsets of F to the N. So like I said before, a local property is intuitively defined as the exclusion of bad sets. So curly B here is gonna be my collection of bad sets. B stands for bad. Um, so I have a, this collection of bad sets so that the following things hold. First, curly B should be invariant under coordinate permutations. Um, so what do I mean by that? Uh, so here, here's a little example of such a bad set down here. Um, so this is uh, curly B is a, a, a collection of bad sets of size two. And when I look at, let's say this bad set and I permute its coordinates, let's say I swap the second and the third coordinate, then I'm gonna get some other bad set in this collection. Um, in this case, I think I'm gonna get B3. And so uh, invariant under coordinate permutations just means like when, when I do these any coordinate permutation I want, I'm gonna stay in the set, so I'm closed under that. Um, and the other property I want, this is where the local comes in, is that the size of each bad set is at most some parameter little b for all little b in curly b. Um, so in this example, little b is equal to two, okay. Um, and so now the, the properties that I'm gonna be interested in are uh, a property P sub curly B, which is uh, there is no bad set B in curly B that is contained in my subspace. So that's a property and I'm gonna call that a B local property. So uh, in this example here, you know, I'll take some subspace V over F2 of uh, dimension four. Um, sorry, here, I guess these uh, vectors with the colors, I guess blue is meant to be one and uh, yeah white is meant to be zero or something like that. Um, so then uh, the property P sub curly B is that none of these pairs of points are contained in V or another way to say it um, for this particular kind of silly property is 
there is no pair x and y and v so that x is the negation of y and x has weight too. That's another way of describing this, this property curly b, um, this little toy example property. Okay, so that, that's the definition of a, of a local property, exclusion of bad sets that also happen to be closed under uh, coordinate permutations. Um, so this, this might seem like uh, maybe a, a strange definition, but actually we've already seen several examples. All of these three problems that we've seen before are examples of local properties. So distance of at least delta n uh, is defined by the exclusion of pairs of points that are too close together. Um, list decodability is defined by the exclusion of uh, L-tuples of points that all live in a Hamming ball. And list recoverability is defined by the exclusion of all L-tuples of points that live in a combinatorial rectangle. Right, so all of these things that I mentioned before are local properties. Um, and there, there are many others that, that come up in, in coding theory. Um, like the, basically, there's a whole bunch of different adjectives you can put in front of list decodability and list recoverability, and, and all those things remain uh, local properties. Okay, so here's uh, sort of one, one main theorem that, that we show, uh, which is that any local property has a sharp threshold for random subspaces. So here's a theorem, uh, let epsilon be greater than zero. For any B local property P sub curly B on F to the N, there is some threshold rate R star so that the picture looks like this. If I back off from R star by epsilon, um, then with really high probability, a random subspace of dimension uh, you know, k uh, equals you know, r n times r star minus epsilon will satisfy the property. And if I go above a little bit, so I look at slightly higher dimensional subspaces, then with probability one minus little of one, a random subspace of that dimension will not satisfy the property. So this threshold picture that I showed earlier um, actually is, is very general to any sort of local property. Um, cool. Uh, but you might be wondering what, what is this threshold R star? Um, and so let me tell you next, like a, a characterization of this threshold. So not only does a sharp threshold exist, but um, it actually has a, has a pretty simple explanation. Um, so I, I'm gonna basically uh, tell you this explanation by uh, example, um, but in order to work out this example, let me just make a few simplifying assumptions. Um, this, will, this is just for the exposition, um, these can be removed. Um, so the first simplifying assumption I wanna make is that uh, every bad set in my collection curly B has size exactly B and also dimension exactly B. So in this example of a bunch of uh, bad sets, I'll say that like each one of these things should have size exactly two and dimension exactly two over F2 in this example. Um, so in particular, they, they should be different so they're not linear combinations of each other. Uh, I'm also going to assume that the, the size of the field F is equal to two. Um, this is literally just so that I have one less parameter floating around on the slide. This is not important at all. Um, and the third thing that I'm going to assume is that uh, curly B contains only one orbit under permutation. So that is, it, it looks like this. I just take one set and when I permute all the coordinates in all of the different ways, I'll get everything else in curly B. Um, we will, uh, I'll, I'll remove this um, in a minute, um, but let, let's assume this for now. <clears throat> okay, so with those simplifying assumptions, let's let's try to answer the question like, what what should this threshold be? Like I've, I've told you, there's a threshold. What what should it be? Let, let's try to guess. Um, so the, the first thing one might try is sort of a first moment attempt. So that, that's what I'm going to do now. So suppose that V is a random k-dimensional subspace, and I would like to upper bound the probability that there is some bad set contained in V. The first thing that I might try is just to compute the, ex number, the expected number of bad sets that are contained in V. If that expected number is really small, then by Markov's inequality, it's really unlikely that there's going to be any bad set in V. Right, so let, let's just compute the expectation of the number of bad sets that are contained in V. All right, so the first thing I want to do is look at the probability that a fixed bad set B is contained in V. So what does that look like? So for some fixed bad set B uh, in curly B, the probability that that bad set is contained in a, in a random subspace of dimension k. Uh, I, I claim that that's equal to two to the k divided by two to the n, all raised to the b. So what is the reason for that? The, the reason is that, um, right, so what's the probability that one, any one point is contained, uh, and any one point in my bad set b is contained in a uh, random subspace? Well, it's two to the k divided by two to the n, because there are two to the k points in my random subspace and two to the n points total. So the probability that a single point is contained in my bad, my bad set or in, in my subspace is this. And the probability that all 
little b of those bad points is contained in a random subspace is this. I, I just raised that to the little b. And the reason I'm allowed to do this is because I, I made that assumption that all of the points in my bad set were linearly independent. So that means when I'm looking at a uh, completely random subspace, the probability that each of them is contained in the random subspace, um, those are actually independent events um, you know, as, as probability and, and notion of independence. Okay, so then the prob so the probability that any bad set um, you know, of size little b satisfying this property that everything in there is independent, linearly independent, is this quantity, which I can also write as two to the minus n minus k times b. Okay, great. Um, all right, so now uh, we know the probability that any one bad set is contained in my random subspace. What's the expected number of bad sets contained in my random subspace? Well, by linearity of expectation, it's just the number of bad sets times that probability that I just computed. Okay. And now uh, to sort of finish out our first moment attempt, we want to say, okay, when, for, for what values of K is, is this number really small? Because right? when this is really small, then uh, by Markov's inequality, I'm, I'm not going to have uh, too many bad sets, or I'm not gonna have any bad sets in my, uh, in my subspace. And so if you can, you can just solve for K, or I guess I solve for K over N here. If you solve for K over N, what you see is that as long as K over N is less than or equal to one minus the log uh, base two of the size of curly B divided by little B times N minus a smidge, um, then uh, this is really small, AKA the probability that there exists a bad set in V is by Markov's inequality at most the expected number of bad sets in V which is uh, once you, if you plug this in up here, this is two to the minus epsilon times n. Um, like I literally just, the, the way I got this is I solved, I solved for k over n in order to make this two to the minus epsilon times n. Okay, um, so this, this threshold here, this one minus log size of b divided by bn, I'm gonna call this the, uh, the expectation threshold of curly b. So this is what you get when you solve this thing equals one. Uh, basically, so this this is the threshold on the on, on k over n, the dimension of the subspace divided by the dimension of the the ambient space, above which you expect there to be tons of bad sets in V, and below which you expect there to be little o of one bad sets in V. Um, so if you look at this plus epsilon, then there's going to be ton, like exponentially bad sets. If you look at this minus epsilon, then uh, you the probability that there's any bad sets is one one over exponential. Okay, um, this makes sense. Should be pretty straightforward. Cool. Okay, so this gives us some guess at a threshold, uh, and we might ask, does this give us the right guess? Right. So, so in particular, what we just saw is that if you look at this expectation threshold, which is some point here uh, on the x-axis, and you back off from that by epsilon, then with really high probability, the property is satisfied. We avoid all of the bad sets. So now we can ask, is is this the right answer? Like, does the right answer look like this? Like, does it? drop down there, or does it keep going? Like maybe does it look like this instead? So if it, if it looked like this instead, like if this were not the right threshold, then what that would mean would be that the expected number of bad sets contained in my subspace is large, but the probability that there exists any such bad set is small. Um, and that, that can happen. Um, that would happen, for example, if there are like some subspaces V that contain tons of bad sets, but most of them don't contain any. That could cause the, uh, the expectation to be large but the probability that any occur to be small. Or another way of saying that is like once my subspace avoids one bad set, um, it's really likely to avoid a bunch of other bad sets. Right. So our, our question is, uh, which of these is the case? So spoiler alert, um, all right, the, the answer is it, it's, it's not quite as simple as just like the first moment thing. Um, but it's almost as simple. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the punchline that we're going for. So let me illustrate that by an example. So let's take a look at this example um, here. So this is a, uh, an example of curly B of, of bad sets. So each of my bad sets is going to have three vectors in it, three vectors of length N. Uh, I guess the blue means one and the, the white means zero. And my bad sets all look like this, a quarter of the, um, coordinates are one, zero, zero, a quarter of the coordinates are one, zero, one, a quarter of the coordinates are zero, one, zero, and a quarter of the coordinates are zero, one, one, in some order, right? So I, I take this and then I'm gonna mix it up in any order I like, and that's gonna give me my collection of bad sets. And I wanna know what is the probability that a random subspace does not contain any triple that looks like this? 
So let's let's do this first moment exercise that we just did. So I'm going to compute this expectation threshold thing, which I've written up there. Um, so first, I need to compute the size of curly B. Um, I claim that it's it's about four to the n. It's not actually four to the n, but it's it's pretty close, um, right? Because for each for each coordinate, I have uh, four choices: this vector, this one, this one, or this one, and each of them occur roughly the same amount of time, so you know, roughly four to the n. There's some lower order terms, but it won't matter. So let's just say that size of b is about four to the n. So then working out this expectation threshold, this turns out to be one minus the log base two of the size of b, which is uh, uh, n times um, n times the log of four, also known as two n, divided by three n, and uh, all this is about a third. Okay, so what that says is that there's this threshold here, which is a third, which is if you back off a little bit, then with really high probability, a random subspace of rate, you know, a little less than n over three is really likely to avoid all of the things that look like that. We might ask, is this the right threshold? Okay, so the answer is no for this example. And here's a way that you can see that the answer is no. Consider what happens when I just ignore this vector. So now I'm gonna consider a new collection of bad sets um, curly B prime. And this is a collection of, of pairs of vectors. So this is bad sets of size two. Uh, and, and these are going to be all pairs of vectors that um, look like these. So in particular, uh, half of the coordinates are one zero and the other half are zero one. So let's do the same exercise that we just did for this new collection, B, curly B prime of bad sets. All right, so uh, now the size of curly B prime is about two to the N um, because there are two possible uh, sort of coordinate things that could show up in each coordinate and they're roughly about the, the same number in each. Um, and so just doing the, the same exercise again, now the expectation threshold for curly B prime is one minus uh, the log of curly B prime divided by now two N, uh, this because my B turned into a two instead of a three, and that's about a half. Um, and the, the important thing to note here is that a half is actually larger than a third. Um, and so what, what that means is that uh, just translating the first moment computation that we did on the couple slides ago, like at, if you, we back off a little bit from a half, so if we look at subspaces of dimension like a little bit less than n over two, then uh, with really high probability, we're going to avoid all pairs of points that look like this. But if we avoid all pairs of points that look like this, then of course we're going to avoid all triples of points that, that look like this because the pair of points was like a subset of the triple. Um, so this here is going to give us actually a lower bound on this original thing that we were plotting, the probability that we avoid all of our original bad sets. So this shows that actually this was not, one third was not the right threshold. This curve was not gonna drop down right there. Instead, it goes at least to a half um, before it's gonna drop down. So this, uh, going back to this question, does this first moment thing always give the right answer? Okay, perhaps not surprisingly that like, okay, the first thing you try doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. Um, and in fact, yes, it, it could be the case that the expectation is large, but the probability that any uh, particular bad set is contained uh, in my subspace is small. All right, disappointing. But um, I, I claim that actually uh, this is almost, like this expectation threshold answer is almost the right answer. And in some sense, that, that example that we just saw is the only bad example. Um, so here's sort of our main theorem. Uh, well, I'll theorem in air quotes, I'll give a slightly more precise theorem in a moment. This example is the only reason that the expectation threshold is not the right threshold. Um, so what, what happened here, we saw that if V avoids some subset curly V prime, that it also avoids curly B. Um, and so if, if curly B prime is smaller than you might think, AKA the expectation threshold of curly B prime is, is larger than you might think, um, then by Markov's inequality, you're, you're more likely to avoid it than you might think. Um, and uh, I claim that that's basically the only thing that can be going on. So to, um, I'm gonna, to, to, to say that a bit more formally, I'm gonna change how I'm drawing this. Instead of saying, um, project these three points onto that two by dropping the third vector, I'm going to draw those three points together as a matrix and multiply it by a coordinate projection matrix. And then I'm gonna generalize just a little bit and say, okay, maybe that matrix doesn't need to be a coordinate projection matrix. Maybe it can just be any old matrix A. Um, and I claim that this is, this is the only reason uh, that the expectation threshold is not the right threshold is that there is some linear projection of my bad set curly B 
or if I've added collection curly B, so that the outcome curly B prime of that projection has a higher expectation threshold. Right? So there's always some sort of first moment explanation uh, for what the right threshold is. It's just, it might not actually come from the set curly B itself. It might come from some projection curly B prime of it, but that's, that's all that can happen. Um, so just say that a little bit more formally. Um, so here's a theorem, um, uh, or you know, theorem still with pictures. Suppose that curly B is a, a single orbit under coordinate permutations. So, so it looks like this, like we talked about. Um, then the correct threshold is the maximum over all matrices A of the expectation threshold of uh, curly B times A. So look at the worst possible projection, um, or sorry, best possible projection, I guess, depending on whose side you're on, um, but the highest possible threshold. And um, that's, going to, uh, that, that's going to completely define R star. Um, okay, so are, are there questions about the statement of, of the theorem? So basically you're just eliminating all linear dependencies, right? From, from exactly. uh, yeah. the code. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and this is also why I said earlier that I was going to assume that B, uh, that the B elements in my bad sets were linearly independent in order to make that first moment thing go through. And this is why it's okay to do that is because I'm just gonna be taking projections. Um, Cool. Okay, so that's just for a single orbit. Um, we might care about properties that there are the union of, of multiple orbits. For example, uh, all of the ones that we saw before are actually unions of, of multiple orbits under coordinate permutation. Um, but it turns out that the answer is, is really similar. Just take the worst possible orbit. Um, so for each orbit, um, sort of compute this, this threshold and then take the smallest one. Um, and that, that'll give you the, the right threshold. Okay, um, how am I on time? Okay, so let me just say um, a few words about the proof, um, which is actually not so difficult. Um, so the, the proof, um, yeah, so basically we, we've essentially already shown that the, uh, the threshold R star is greater than or equal to the maximum over all A of this expectation threshold. That was this first moment argument that I just did. Um, and so the meat is that we, we need to show that um, that's actually the right answer, that it's not going to get any higher by, you know, because of anything else. That is, we want to show that if we're looking at a subspace of dimension, uh, you know, a little bit bigger than that threshold plus epsilon, um, sorry, we're looking, at, if it is the case that uh, the dimension, the rate of the code or the dimension divided by n is greater than or equal to uh, the threshold, um, the expectation threshold of my bad set times any projection A um, plus epsilon, then a random subspace of dimension K is very, very likely to contain some bad set. This is what we want to show. Cool. Okay, um, so yeah, the, the proof is actually not, not so hard um, kind of once you know it, but you're, but you're showing. Uh, basically, it, it's, an, it's essentially just the second moment method. And uh, I think the hard part is, is coming up with Understanding that the right thing, uh, the right thing to look at are these orbits under um, under perm under coordinate permutations and these linear projections. And once you have that, uh, can just kind of sort of follow your nose almost. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but basically. Um, so I'll just have one slide about the idea. So uh, the proof follows from the second moment method. So let's uh, let X capital X be the number of bad sets B in curly B that are contained in my random subspace V. So then by, by Chebyshev's inequality, uh, AKA the second moment method, the probability that X equals zero, so the probability that there are no bad sets contained in my subspace um, is small. It's smaller than uh, the variance of X divided by the expectation of X squared. And, and this, is, this is what we want to bound because we, we wanna show that um, it's very likely that a, a higher dimensional subspace is going to contain some bad sets, AKA we wanna show that it's very likely that um, the number of bad sets is going to be equal to zero. Um, so we, we already computed this expectation. That was the, the first moment thing that I did. So now we just want to bound the variance. Okay. And if we think for a minute about what the variance computation will look like, I'm not going to go through the, the computation, um, but I just want to wave my hands about why looking at linear projections um, sort of comes up naturally in this computation. Right. So basically to bound the variance of X, the, the number of bad sets in uh, V, we need to bound um, just these uh, sort of second order things. Like what's the probability that two distinct bad sets are both contained in B? 
Okay, so the first thing, you know, we, we might hope uh, if we're not paying too much attention that um, the probability that both of two bad sets are in V is the probability that the first bad set is in V times the probability that the second bad set is in V, you know, just by independence. Um, but of course that does not work. These are not independent. Um, they're not independent because if B and B prime, um, for example, have some non-trivial intersection, uh, then um, uh, they're not going to be independent, obviously. Um, however, what we can say is that this is at most um, the probability that my first bad set is contained in my random subspace times the probability that my second bad set times some suitable projection A is contained in my subspace. And the suitable projection A is basically just saying project away from B um, so that things become linearly independent and hence stochastically independent. Um, but uh, the, the whole point was that we were assuming that the the rate, um, sort of the dimension was big enough that it was bigger than this expectation threshold, not just for curly B, but for curly B times A for any projection A. So in particular for this projection A. Um, so our first moment argument shows that both of these are small and then we can bound the variance. Um, so that, that's basically the idea. Um, the actual uh, proof, um, I guess to, to do it out, Quantita quantitatively, in, with quantitative details, um, we sort of look at look at uh, entropy of these um, the coordinate distributions and found that. Um, but this is the basic idea. Cool. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's uh, all I wanted to say about the uh, the the theorem. Um, I guess do I have like five or ten minutes left? Is that about right? Something like that. Cool. Okay. So that. say again. Yeah, I think about five, four or five minutes. Yeah. Oh, four or five minutes. Okay, cool. All right, so let me talk real quick about applications. Um, right, so I, I promised you uh, that this theorem would actually be, this characterization theorem would actually be useful in a useful way to um, carry over properties from random subspaces to uh, uh, more structured random subspaces. Um, so actually, at this point, we've, we've managed to come up with a couple of applications of this theorem. The one that I'm going to tell you about today that I mentioned at the beginning was for LDPC codes. We can also use this theorem to bound um, to get better bounds on the list decodability and list recoverability of random linear codes themselves. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, you can check out this paper if you, if you want to want to see more about that. But uh, what I'm going to talk about now is is this uh, application to LDPC codes. Okay, so uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, uh, LDPC codes. This stands for low density parity check codes, um, and so going back to that um, communication motivation that I had at the beginning, uh, I said that you know uh, if a sender wants to communicate to a receiver and they have a big set of points that are all really far apart, they can do that pretty well. Um, I didn't say anything about efficient algorithms. Um, and if you, in fact, look at a, a random linear subspace and try to use that as your, uh, as your code, um, it seems very unlikely that there are going to be efficient algorithms to, to do that unless um, you know, crypto is broken, basically. Uh, and so uh, people don't use that in practice. Instead, people use other sorts of distributions uh, or other sorts of constructions of codes. And one construction that's used a lot is a low density parity ch check code. And basically the, 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 the definition of a low density, low, excuse me, let me get my words back together. The definition of a low density parity check code is uh, that it's, it's the kernel of a sparse matrix. Um, so there was a question earlier that, that uh, alluded to this. Um, and the sparse matrices that I'm going to consider, consider in particular are uh, Gallagher's ensemble of sparse matrices. So this is a, a particular ensemble of, of LDPC codes. So it's a random sparse matrices. They were introduced by, by Gallagher in the 60s and he proved lots of um, nice properties about them. And LDPC codes are nice because they have really fast, unique decoding algorithms for the sender and the receiver. And for this reason, they're ubiquitous in, in both theory and practice. Um, but one question uh, that was still open is, are they list decodable? Um, so I said they had unique decoding algorithms. That means they really nicely solved this, this first question I gave about the distance, pairwise distance. But how about more points, you know, L-wise distance or something? Are, are there any L points that live in a Hamming ball? Um, and, and, and this was still open. Um, and so just translating this to a math question, like if we, uh, look at this structured random subspace, so the kernel of a random sparse matrix, um, like what's the probability that not too many points uh, are contained in any Hamming ball of radius Pn? Um, and it turns out that uh, we can actually just get an answer to this for free from our uh, characterization. So here's a theorem. Suppose that P sub curly B is a B local property, um, like we defined before. Suppose that epsilon is greater than zero. And suppose that a random subspace of dimension R times N satisfies that property with high probability. 
So the, the picture looks like this. Um, remember, for a random subspace, we have this R star, and this is just saying we're in this part of that picture. Then the conclusion of the theorem is that a random LDPC code of dimension a little bit less than that is going to satisfy that property with high probability also. So any, any part of the orange curve that is close to one, that's also close to one for a random LDPC code. So this can transfer positive results from uh, uniformly random subspaces to these more structured random subspaces. And as a corollary, random LDPC codes are uh, optimally list decodable because we happen to know that uh, random uh, linear codes are also uh, optimally list decodable. Okay, so I have two minutes. I can give you the whole proof idea in two minutes. Uh, or maybe I have zero minutes, but I'll give you the whole proof idea in one minute and split the difference. Um, so the, the first thing we show is a lemma that says that if I'm looking at these random LDPC codes, the probability that uh, a particular bad set B, any bad set B is contained in a random LDPC code uh, looks very much like the probability that it's contained in a completely random subspace. Um, so this, this is the same thing we got for a completely random subspace, except there's some one minus epsilon that's thrown in there where epsilon has to do with the sparsity of the sparse matrix. Um, okay, so given this lemma, um, suppose that I have some bad, bad collection of sets that's unlikely to appear in a random linear code. So what we showed before in this characterization theorem is that essentially there's a first moment reason why that is true. There's some projection of this bad set so that the expectation threshold uh, kind of explains um, why that bad set is unlikely to, to appear in a random linear code. Um, but then the same first moment reason is going to hold for a random LDPC code because the only thing you need to make to do that sort of first moment argument is this statement, the probability that a single bad set is contained in a random LDPC code, and it's basically the same as for a random linear code. Um, so therefore, curly B is also unlikely to be contained in a random LDPC code, the end. Um, so that, that, that's the, the whole proof. Um, so I had one slide about the proof idea for the lemma, but let me skip that um, and uh, just quickly con conclude. Um, so just to, to recap, um, so I started out the talk by asking what local properties are satisfied by random subspaces. And we saw three examples, which I waved my hands about being useful in coding theory. And I told you that uh, it, for those three, three examples and also in general, uh, local properties have sharp thresholds. And moreover, I can, uh, or we, we can tell you sort of exactly what that threshold is um, uh, in, in terms of um, this sort of expectation threshold thing. And so the answer is that a first moment calculation is almost the right answer, not quite, you might need to take projections, but other than that, that's it. Um, and then uh, at the very end, I sort of waved my hands about an application to um, list decodability of random LDPC codes. Um, okay, so let me end with just a few open questions. Um, so the first open question is, uh, what are some other applications of this characterization? So like I mentioned, we, we found a couple in coding theory, um, but of course the ones that I'm likely to think of are, are likely to be in coding theory. Um, so I, I'm very curious if there are other applications that, that I might not think of in other areas. Um, so if, if you have any, I would love to hear that. Um, and the other big question uh, from the last part of the talk is actually algorithms for list decoding LDPC codes. Um, I kind of motivated LDPC codes by, ooh, they're algorithmically nice. And that's true for unique decoding. Um, and our motivation for studying the list decodability is because we would like to get algorithms, uh, good algorithms. So, so far we've shown that it's, it's possible. You know, there's, uh, there's not too many points contained in any Hamming ball, so it should be possible to return them all efficiently. Um, but how do you actually do that? Uh, that is a question I, I do not know the answer to. Um, so, okay, so with that, uh, I will wrap up and take any other questions you have. Um, thanks for listening.